Oh, okay, I'm already sweating. This is gonna be a tough video to get through. Hey everyone, welcome to X Bundy Diaries. My name is Ellie, my pronouns are she, her, and in this video I'm going to be talking about my father's domestic violence and abuse. It is October, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so I felt like this would be a good time to start talking about it. I've been working up the courage, and I think I'm ready. I want to give a very strong content warning here at the beginning. I'm going to be discussing many different types of abuse, including emotional, verbal, psychological, and physical abuse. Watching this video could be very triggering for anyone who has gone through similar experiences, so please feel free to skip this video or to take breaks if you're not able to watch it all the way through. I am not a psychologist or a therapist, so please don't view me as an expert because I'm definitely not and I would really encourage you to do your own research about this topic. One great place to start is the Power and Control Wheel. This was created by Ellen Pence, Michael Paymar, and Carol McDonald, and it's a very helpful tool for seeing the complexity of domestic violence. Because often, when people think of the term domestic violence, what they picture is physical abuse and physical abuse only. But domestic violence is actually an interconnected set of abuse and control tactics that all work together to keep the person who is being abused dependent on their abuser. I was first introduced to the power and control wheel by my aunt. I'm so grateful that she gave me this information because it was extremely validating to what I had experienced and it helped me understand, number one, that there was a purpose and a reason to everything my dad was doing and there was also a reason why my mom was unable to leave him for so long and how it actually took myself and my younger sibling giving her an ultimatum for her to be able to get a restraining order. I also want to point out that anyone of any gender can be abusive and anyone of any gender can be abused. The power and control wheel does have a section for male privilege and certainly misogynistic and patriarchal violence is extremely prevalent and it is important to talk about that dynamic but I would like to also point out that it is not just cisgender men abusing cisgender women. There are many different instances of abuse and there are many complex issues that contribute to those relationships of domestic violence. Unfortunately, I feel like probably a large portion of the people who watch my videos have probably experienced much of this. And that is because Fundamentalist Christianity is inherently abusive. It is authoritarian and hierarchical and patriarchal and the umbrella of protection is one example of a model that is used for power and control, especially over women and femmes and girls and children who are being raised as girls. So I'm going to talk about my experiences now. The domestic violence in my home did not start in earnest until 2008 when I was 16, just about to turn 17. However, before that, there were many unhealthy and toxic dynamics that were happening in my family basically my whole life. My dad would have very aggressive outbursts of anger when I was very little. 
I remember when I was six, seven, and eight years old, he would fly into a rage and I would be so afraid of him that I would go and hide behind the couch. And this was such a common occurrence that I remember being very used to it. It didn't surprise me, but it always scared me. And so my routine was just to run to the back of the couch and to kind of wait out the storm of my father being unable to control his emotions. Or maybe being unwilling to control his emotions. I don't know which is more accurate. Things between my parents were tense most of the time. My mom knew that she had to submit to and obey my dad, but she had a hard time doing it, especially before 2008. As a young child who was being taught that women must submit to men, especially wives must submit to husbands, sometimes I would blame her for not submitting to him properly that that is what made him angry, and that is what made them fight. And so it was her fault. I was being taught that the way she was behaving was sin. I myself as a child was being punished for the times that I didn't obey my mother, because in the umbrella of protection, she was the covering over me, and the one that I needed to submit to, in addition to God and my dad. And I also knew that my mom was supposed to obey and submit to my dad and to God. And this just shows how, from a very young age, these authority structures were in place in our family. And this ideology that there was a hierarchy of obedience that included the adults, that one had to obey the other because she was inherently less than, that that is how God created her and how God created him. That just made it so easy for things to go the way that they did in 2008. All of that groundwork, all of that framework was already in place and already set up. Even before 2008, we treated my father like a king. And the best example that I have of this is these annual daddy appreciation dinners that we would put on for him. This was my mom's idea, but we kids would help her clean the whole house, decorate the living room, make a feast. We had this roll of red plastic that was about this wide that we would roll out on the floor from the doorway out through the front yard and to the sidewalk where he would be getting out of his car when he got home from work. And we called it the red carpet. And he would walk down the red carpet into our home while we sang our own version of For He's a Jolly Good Fellow which in our version went, for he's a jolly good daddy, which nobody can deny. And yes, I did call him daddy all throughout my teenage years, probably up until I was honestly probably 20 years old. That really grosses me out now. I wrote out a timeline of events that I'm just going to go through I think it will help me organize my thoughts a little bit and hopefully it will give you watching a better picture of how things progressed in our family from 2008 when the domestic violence really started all the way until September 2014 which is when my mom got a restraining order for herself and my youngest sibling. So this was over the course of seven years. In the year 2007, I could notice a change happening in my dad. Besides the fact that he was around less and less, when he was around, he was extremely quick-tempered, moping a lot. And because I was so codependent with 
both of my parents, I was really affected by it and I was always trying to cheer him up, to encourage him, to build him up, basically do whatever I could to help him feel better. In February 2008, he finally told me that he wanted to divorce my mom. And this was a huge shock to me. I cannot even put into words how deeply this affected me because of the way that I was brought up to view marriage in the Christian fundamentalist context. Marriage was a picture of Christ and the church and God hates divorce. It really felt like the world was ending. I felt so extremely betrayed by my dad even saying that. He also said, and in case you're wondering, there's no one else. And turns out he was having an affair. This was his second affair with the same person. The first time was when I was six. When I felt betrayed by my dad, I didn't just feel betrayed for me. I felt betrayed on behalf of my mom. And I really started to align with her and kind of take up her struggle as my own. And as time would go on, I would try to protect her. I would try to stand up to my dad for her because she wouldn't leave. And she allowed him to abuse her and to, be, to abuse us kids. I also tried to convince my dad to stay with my mom and to keep our family together. I wrote a 10 page document that I called a case for a new beginning that I gave to him. I edited a video with clips of us as a family and of he and my mom together. I remember being very frustrated and very worried that I could find very few clips out of all of our family videos of my mom and dad happy together. There was even this one clip of them kissing. Looking back on it now, my mom did not want to kiss him and he kind of forced her to do it. I honestly didn't realize that until this moment. Um, but at the time I didn't know anything about consent and so it just looked like she just wasn't very happy. So I remember slowing the clip down so that it looked like they mutually wanted to kiss each other. And I cut off the clip before it showed my mom pulling away with a disgusted look on her face. I didn't have much to work with in terms of clips that I can include of the two of them happy together. That should have shown me how miserable their marriage was, but I obviously couldn't see it as a 17 year old and especially being raised the way that I was. I also wrote a very long letter to my dad about a month after I had made the case for a new beginning and the video and in the letter I was basically just being very honest with him about my feelings and about my fears about him leaving my mom and breaking up our family and I even included a very long passage from a 2004 Above Ruby's magazine written by Nancy Campbell and the passage was all about godly marriages and how Satan loved to attack them. Nancy was concerned that divorce was starting to become acceptable in Christian circles, but that it was never acceptable and that it was always worth saving a marriage no matter what. But my mom wouldn't allow me to give this letter to my dad. And I find it really telling and illuminating that I didn't even feel comfortable at that point to give the letter to my dad. I had to run it by my mom first. And that really encapsulates the dynamic that was happening. My dad was a ticking time bomb at all times and he could go off at any moment. And so my mom was trying to avoid that 
but she was also trying really, really hard to do everything that he wanted her to do to basically be perfect so that he wouldn't leave. She would go to the track two times a day for a certain time period in order to lose weight and to be basically thin and beautiful and perfect for him. She never used to dress up unless it was, you know, a special occasion or going to church, but she started dressing up every day, wearing like kind of low cut shirts and doing her hair and makeup. She never wore makeup. That was like a Christmas, you know, Easter kind of thing for her. And no matter what he did to us or to her, my mom expected us, especially me as the oldest, to obey him, to honor him, to respect him, to love him, to shower him with praise and gifts, and to basically fall at his feet and worship him all the time. So she didn't want me to be honest with him. She didn't want me to say or do anything that could make him more mad than he already was. So I never gave the letter to him, but I still have it. This idea that my parents could get divorced was so earth shattering for me. I was having suicidal ideation. I was extremely tempted to cut myself, which I have realized recently, the way that I even knew that people would self-harm is actually from the Lifehouse Everything skit. I don't remember when I first saw that. It may have been at a church or maybe my dad had shown it to me, but that's where I even got the idea that I could do that to myself to cope. And it was extremely tempting to me. I thought about it and fantasized about it all the time. Sometimes when my parents weren't home, I would go to the kitchen and I would pick up a knife, one of the kitchen knives, the sharp ones, and I would just hold it and I would feel the edge of the knife and imagine what it would feel like going into my skin. But what stopped me from ever doing it was God. I knew that God would be angry with me if I did that. So I never actually followed through, but I found other ways to self-harm, loopholes essentially. Somehow I was able to rationalize to myself that if I didn't use a knife, to cut myself, then it wasn't actually really self-harm and God wouldn't be mad at me. So I would bite my tongue and the insides of my cheeks, which was something I could do anytime, which was very convenient. So, you know, when my dad would be um, screaming at us, I could do this self-harm act very privately and it would just help me distract myself just a little bit and cope with the overwhelming emotional distress that I was experiencing. The other thing that I would do um, in bed at night, a lot of my most distressing thoughts would surface and sometimes my dad was screaming at my mom while I was trying to get to sleep. So I would scratch my legs with my nails and I would scratch them really hard and leave marks. So obviously I was self-harming, but I was able to convince myself that it wasn't self-harm because I wasn't cutting like I wanted to. My parents had bought a house in another state in 2006, but the house just sat there for two years. In the summer of 2008, we took a month long trip to this house in the other state to paint it, to redo the floors, to get new carpeting, all the different light fixtures, and to redo the bathrooms. And my dad had me and my middle sibling, Annie, work with him and my mom on the house all day, pretty much nonstop. And sometimes he and my mom would go 
do something else, play a game, have a fight, go for a walk, have really, really loud makeup sex. That was a, also a very unpleasant, very traumatizing, unfortunate, recurring theme over these years was their very, very loud makeup sex that would happen in the middle of the day at the drop of a hat, really. And I told my mom many times how deeply uncomfortable it was for me to have to hear them having sex. And, um, you know, the walls were thin and we could hear everything. Ugh, it's, it's disgusting. It's gross to have to talk about. My mom's solution to me being so upset by this was to tell me ahead of time. She would knock on my bedroom door and say, your dad and I are going to spend some time together now so that I could turn on music and put on my headphones and just turn the volume up as loud as I could and just like pretend that I didn't know what was happening and that I didn't already know in detail what it sounded like because I had to hear it all the time. I would imagine based on the misogynistic teachings of fundamentalist Christianity that she was trying to be joyfully available to him all the time, no matter what, even after him screaming at her, belittling her, putting her down, calling her names, um, mocking her, and physically abusing her, um, she would still have sex with him. It's just awful. And, and at the time, you know, even at 17, 18, it also was so deeply distressing to have to reconcile these instances of abuse with this turn around and have sex right away. This is yet another reason why I love and lean on this quote by Bell Hooks, love and abuse cannot coexist. Those lines were so blurred and love and abuse was so interconnected, especially during this time period. So summer 2008 was the first time that I actually witnessed my dad enact physical violence on my mom. We were at the track taking a break from working on the house. The track was maybe a mile away. So we had driven there to the track. I was running around the track. My younger siblings were walking and just sort of goofing around and maybe sitting on a bench nearby. My parents had been doing their own workouts, but then had stopped to get into a very long fight. And there was no one else at this track. It was just my family. But uh, my parents were in the middle of the grass. They were pretty far away from me, but I had stopped to watch because things were escalating and escalating and my dad was getting more and more aggressive. And my mom, as she often did all throughout this time, was threatening to take us and leave. Because we were in a different state working on the house, she was threatening to take us kids back to our home state and to leave him there. And he screamed at her, called her a bitch, as he often did. And then he was holding a soccer ball because I think that was somehow included in his workout. And he drop kicked it into her thighs. And he was only about two feet away from her. And he, you know, grew up playing soccer, played soccer in college, was a soccer coach. That was his profession. So he knew how to kick a soccer ball really hard. And he did full force into her thighs. I and my younger siblings started bawling and in the midst of all this chaos, my parents got in their car and they drove back to the house and left us there at the track after what we had just witnessed. And so I was trying to comfort Annie and our younger sibling Ivor, who was only five, I think. And then we had to walk back home by ourselves. So we basically just sobbed all the way 
home. And then when we got there, we had to wait outside for two and a half hours while my parents continued their fight inside. And then, you know, my dad essentially said, I want to work this out, but if your mom leaves, I will divorce her. And that was always the fear that he would leave, that he would divorce her. Even though she would threaten to leave at these times when he would get so out of control, she never followed through and was actually always working to keep him. And the thing about the physical violence that my dad would enact towards my mom, most of it was done behind closed doors. He was very open in his verbal, psychological, and emotional abuse of her. And he would do that to all of us kids, especially me and Annie. But most, not all, because I do have some memories of seeing it happen. I remember one time in the kitchen, he bit her cheek and pulled her by the hair to the ground. So I do remember seeing that and as well as some other times, but most of it was behind closed doors, not in front of us kids. It would be, they would have long, long, long fights in their bedroom. Shortly after this would happen, my mom would pull me aside, very upset, and she would point to the bruises developing on her arms or her neck or her chest or her face. And she would say, look what he did to me. And I would get so angry and upset. And sometimes I would start crying and I would say, mom, this isn't right. This isn't fair. You can't let him keep treating you like this. You have to leave him. You can't let him hurt you. Or I would just start venting about how horrible he was. But as soon as I would say those things, and as soon as I would agree with her that this was wrong, and that I would show my anger and my sadness and pain over it, then she would switch. And she would start commanding me to stop speaking badly about him. And later that day, her story would have changed. Instead of my dad making those bruises on her body, then she would say, oh, silly me, you know, I'm just so clumsy. I ran into a table or, you know, I ran into the doorway. And she would insist that it was just her clumsiness and that he had nothing to do with it. So in July of that summer, 2008, is when my dad claims that he cut off contact with the woman that he was having the affair with. And at this point, I actually didn't even know yet that he had had an affair. I would find out about a month after that on accident. But my mom believed that he had actually continued having this affair. That even though, you know, she saw the email that he sent this woman that supposedly ended things, my mom was convinced that that was just a front and that he continued to see her. And this became the heart of the conflict between them, their main focus over the remaining six and a half years. And my dad was always trying to convince me that he was a changed man. And my mom was always trying to convince me that my dad was still having an affair and still cheating on her. And my mom told me that the only way she would leave my dad is if she had definitive proof of my dad's affair that she could take to the pastor of our church or um, the elders in the church. So this contributed very intimately to the cycle of domestic violence that was happening. So in September of that year, 2008, my mom filed for legal separation with minor children. But even though she 
did open this court case, nothing came of it. And one dynamic that was present all throughout these seven years was my mom initiating these separations from my dad. There were some in-home separations. They would still live at the same house, but they wouldn't sleep together, I guess. And then there were some almost like opposite versions of that where he would stay somewhere else and then he would come home to have sex. And supposedly during that time they were separated. I would guess at least once a year. There may have been years where it was twice a year. So once a year would have been seven separations. Twice a year would have been 14. And very shortly after my mom filed for legal separation for the first time, my dad went away to a Christian men's conference by the author John Eldridge. His ministry is called Wild at Heart and this particular conference is called Boot Camp. He had these fake dog tags. This was a part of the conference where all the men who attended would get dog tags going with the boot camp theme. It had, I believe, his name on it and the date. And he basically came home from this conference with these dog tags saying that he was a completely changed man that during the conference, he had had a spiritual experience with God that was transformative, that he finally understood his sonship, that he was God's son. And basically that we needed to shut up and get on board, that he was changed and now we just needed to believe him and basically move on as a family. And in the middle of fights and violent outbursts, he would pull the dog tags out from underneath his shirt because he would always wear them. And he would hold them up and shake them in my mom's face or in my face as he expressed once again that he was a changed man and that he wouldn't stand for being falsely accused by his accusers, which was us. He would always put himself as the victim and he would always say that he was the one being abused. What we were putting him through was unbearable. And what he would say about his anger, it was an expression of his sadness and pain. When we would cry in the middle of him screaming and yelling and throwing things, he would say that him screaming and yelling and throwing things was the equivalent of crying. That when we saw him being angry, we should think of it as crying. Because women cry, men get angry. And he did throw things and damage um, the inside of our home on a regular basis. He would throw chairs, he would punch walls, he would punch dressers, he would throw objects. One time he threw gifts that I had given him for his birthday at me. He just opened my door without warning and I was sitting on my bed and he threw the gifts at me that I had given him a couple days before. Every room of our house had at least one hole in the wall because of how often he was expressing his rage by punching and kicking and throwing things. In May of 2009, my mom submitted a dismissal request and the case for legal separation with minor children was closed. In November of 2009, he kicked a hole in my bedroom door. And the way that this came to be, he had been uh, yelling at my mom and abusing her and I had come and I had stood in the doorway of the room, glaring at my dad, which was one way, kind of the only way I was really able to stand up for myself to him was by glaring at him, making sure that my face made it very clear about how I felt about his behavior and the way he was treating us. 
And he got extremely, extremely angry with me. And so he ended up, you know, getting up in my face and yelling in my face. And he actually spit in my face and he flipped me off and he was screaming, you know, fuck you, bitch, and things like that. I ran to my room and I locked the door and he followed me and he started yelling at me outside of my door that if I didn't open the door right then, he would kick my bedroom door down. And I didn't think that he was serious, but he was, and he started kicking my door. It didn't come off the hinges, but he kicked it so hard that it swung open. It broke the lock of the door and it kind of skewed the door on the hinges and it left a gaping hole in the front of my bedroom door. And honestly, I can't remember what happened next. After he kicked the door open, I honestly, my memory cuts off right there. So I have no idea what happened after that. But I do remember that later that day, after my dad had left in a huff, um, I was complaining to my mom, you know, crying and telling her that there was a hole in my bedroom door now and the door wouldn't close properly. And she told me, it's okay, honey, we'll get a poster. We'll put a poster over it and no one will know. And I could see how that was such a metaphor for what was happening in our family, that we just put band-aids over things. We couldn't let anyone know what was happening. We just covered it up. I just felt so devastated, you know, that my mom was saying, don't worry, honey, we'll just put a poster over it. No one will know. As if the biggest problem was me feeling embarrassed that other people who came to our house would see this hole in my door. Not the fact that my father kicked a fucking hole in my door because I was trying to get away from his abuse. In February of 2010, which is when I turned 19, my parents paid for a Christian reconciliation mediation company to come to our church and have what my mom called the confrontation. And I was able to come to part of it. A couple of like elders from the church, the pastor was there. My parents each had a friend come with them on either side of the table. And then there were these people I had never met before. And my parents had paid for them to come from another state to do this confrontation. Just a wild waste of money. It was very traumatizing and it was such a big deal. And there was so much build up to this event and nothing came of it. So things continued to escalate and it was in August, 2010 that I moved out to live with my grandparents. And in February of 2012, so I was 21 and away at Christian college, my mom filed for dissolution of the marriage. So as I understand it, that is actually divorce, not legal separation. It was a whole big thing. I crashed down into a depression and my grades started slipping and I was having just such a hard time coping at school. And a month later, the case was closed. Almost every time, you know, I got so hopeful and that time in particular felt like, it really felt like it was real this time. Like that our suffering was going to finally come to an end, that my mom was gonna follow through this time. But it only took one month for her to close that case. And it would be another two and a half years before my mom finally got the restraining order. And again, it was because of the ultimatum that my middle sibling Annie and I gave my mom that if she didn't separate for the safety of our youngest sibling, 
that we were going to make our own CPS report. The last thing that I would like to share is that somewhere along the way, my dad gave my mom a copy of Created to be His Help Meet by Debbie Pearl. And as I'm sure many of you watching already know, this book encourages wives who are being abused, even physically abused, to stay with their husbands, that it is wrong for them to leave their husbands. Fundy Fridays has an excellent video about Michael and Debbie Pearl, and the video does talk about Created to Be His Help Meet. Again, I would guess that most of you watching have already seen this video and probably love Fundy Fridays as much as I do, but on the off chance that anyone watching has not seen this video, I will put a link down below. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is that all of my dad's domestic violence and abuse tactics were backed up by this toxic theology that he had a God-given right to treat my mom and to treat us kids this way. Every act of violence and misogyny and harm was done in the name of God. And that is, once again, an example of why Christian fundamentalism is so dangerous and why I am so passionate about exposing it and speaking out against it. This was very tough to get through, actually a lot tougher than I was expecting, but I am very glad that I am sharing this I know that it is going to be very helpful for my healing. I hope that it is helpful for someone else. The video coming out after this is thankfully going to be quite a bit more lighthearted and hopefully a little bit fun. If this felt way too heavy, please stay tuned. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.